Well, I am really excited to be here today to share my passion with you and a little bit of the journey that uh, brought me here over the last 30 years, I suppose, from uh, the first days of high school computer class uh, all the way to my current involvement in energy. Uh, how many of you know what this is? Solar, that's right. This is uh, what I'm really passionate about because this is the heart of a major change that will sweep the globe in the next one to two decades. Myself and a few friends believe so strongly in it that we mounted 38,000 of these, not five miles from here, uh, and built an energy education and demonstration center to help people understand exactly what's going on and how it's gonna change. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. But first, I must digress. When I think about uh, the last years and in information technology and energy technology, uh, this is the forefront of energy technology. And uh, during my life, computers and phones have been at the front edge of information technology. And I remember as a fresh engineering graduate, the only thing I could think about wanting to get my hands on one of these. All right. Uh, wasn't I going to be cool, stylish, you know, go to the Get, yeah, get my cell phone out and uh, be ready to make some calls. And uh, oh, look at me, look how important I am. I've got a ability to communicate. I am mobile. Uh, you know, and after engineering school, a little bit later, I moved on to be an entrepreneur. And that wasn't good enough. I had to have one that was better, faster, smaller. You know, hey, right, that's right. Not only did this talk, I could take pictures with it. I could even do text. It's pretty amazing. And then not long after that, I thought, well, that's not good enough. I need something even better than that. And along comes a computer in my pocket. And not only is it a phone, but it is a camera. It is, can do spreadsheets and it can do all types of applications. And I would bet there's not anybody in here that doesn't have one of these either in your pocket, in your purse or in the car or at your house. I, I would also be willing to bet that I could offer any one of you some money and no one would give it up because its value isn't in the device, its value is in what it does for you. And I would say that every one of you, depend, if you're like me, your contacts, uh, your, all of your web pages you like to go to, all of the things that you like to do day in and day out, this is rocketed right up into the top, you know, beyond family and food and faith, maybe it's right up there, maybe in front of friends <laughs> in terms of what it means to you. And before I go a little forward and explain the basis of what makes me believe that energy technology is the next information technology, this is the ultimate expression of information technology right here. Uh, Steve Jobs said one day everybody will have a computer and lo and behold, <laughs> everybody does. And I'd like everybody, if they would, just to think about what this means to me. And it's really easy to do if you go back a, a few years ago when we suffered uh, horrific tornadoes came through town and we were without power for several days. And if you can remember back what it's like to be without power and without communications, trying to figure out how to keep this thing charged, how to communicate, what it meant. So hold on to that thought if you would just what this meant to you, this information technology to you in your life. So to lay the groundwork, I've got to go back to an important part of my life to talk about what leads to this adoption. But now I've got to, I've got to break out the school teacher in me. I, I spent a, a decade, uh, probably some of the proudest time of my life, working in Atlanta on a Inform, uh, a school that was doing very advanced information technology integrated in the classroom. Uh, we opened 1995 and spent almost a decade uh, doing some really neat stuff with computers in the classroom, video to the desktop. It was, again, one of the proudest things I did, and it was a horrific financial failure. And, and to this day, it's a great lesson for me that not everything's about money, that some things are more important than money, but yet, if you want to do what you're passionate about, you got to figure out a way to make it work. So with that, I'd like to lay the groundwork in my teacher mode for a few slides here as to how I believe that energy technology will be the next information technology. This is pretty basic stuff. You know, 
the bottom line is you might have some type of phone or device and it, the cost comes down over time. It becomes more cost effective. Originally, only a few people really wanted to buy one of these bag phones because it was expensive and you didn't have much utilization for it. But over time, it gets less expensive, gets more valuable, and it reaches this tipping point. And when it reaches the tipping point, that's when it starts to have widespread adoption. Everybody wants one, everybody can afford one, and everybody has one. And over history, we've seen a number of times where this sort of tipping effect, uh, tipping effect took place. And if you're in the IT world, you'll, how many of you ever heard of the word the killer application? Well, the killer application is really when technology meets a need in the marketplace. And uh, over history, there's been a number of times when that happened. And I'm gonna focus in on the ones that are IT. In the computing world, it wasn't that long ago that that when we wanted to compute, we had to go get our computing capability from the mainframe. We didn't, everything was centralized and uh, you were not able to do any computing. And who would have thought that you know, 30 years later that you've got a computer not only in your hand, but this is capable of doing all the things that these mainframe computers could do back uh, in, in, my, in my lifetime, when I first arrived at engineering school the first year, we were still using punch cards on the mainframe before we shifted. So it's just not been that long ago. And with the computer, what was very interesting, computers were available for a while before they took off. And it was the spreadsheet that really was the application that caused the computer to just take off. It was because business owners realized, hey, I can do my bookkeeping with uh, this as opposed to having bookkeepers. And that allowed more of them to sell. The more they sold, the faster they got, the cheaper they got. And that similarly followed in telecommunications when, when wireless became capable and the telecommunication lines were freed, the cell phone was the application. And then building on that later, Google was really the application that allowed us access to information. And in all of these instances, what's really going on is we're moving from centralized control to distributed systems, distributed uh, capabilities. So as we now stand and look squarely at what's going on in energy, right now, if we take a look at the past and the present and the future, what's interesting about energy, if we look at the past, not much has changed. If we look at the grid that was designed by Thomas Edison for the city of New York over 120 years ago, big central power plant, wires running out to the end user, the end user consuming the power. Our, our energy infrastructure is largely unchanged. Now it's advanced with some technology obviously, but largely that same uh, system is in place. And right now what's happening is we're capable with technology of doing distributed generation in the form of microgrids and the killer application is gonna be solar. And that solar is gonna allow you to do many things that will allow you freedom from being wholly dependent on the grid for your energy. So what's gonna drive this to happen the fastest? The pain of that red area, which is during the middle of the day, in a typical day, everybody wants their energy at the same time. They all want to hit their air conditioning, run their electronics. This energy in the middle of the day, it's called peak energy. It's the most expensive energy. It is the, the one that is growing the fastest. And the utility systems are going to begin to charge you in the future for when you want to use your energy. And that is going to drive more and more people to want to make their own energy during the middle of the day. And that we have just now reached the tipping point with solar in that you can make energy cheaper than you can buy it from the grid during the time that is in the red. The other part that will drive this change is that aging infrastructure, while our modern grid is uh, a, a work of, uh, it's just a marvel, it is old. The average age of most of the grid componentry is 40 years. And in some instances, it's older than that in the Northeast. And in some areas, globally, there's even no infrastructure. And what will happen in the future is much like what happened with the cellular industry. When they went into developing countries, just started with cell towers. No need for centralized distri distribution. And it goes without saying we're all aware of the environmental concerns that we have about how we make and consume energy right now. And it's not a sustainable way to go about doing that. So what's missing? What's going to be the component that causes this to accelerate. 
in computer speak or information technology speak, we have the wide area network and the local area network. So every day we go to offices, we work on computers, we go to schools, work on computers, or even at home and we have our local area networks connected to the wide area network to get to the internet or servers for work. In our current energy infrastructure, there is no local area network. There is only the wide area network. And this is what will lead to the explosive growth over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years of infrastructure filling in that gap for the local area network. The, excuse me. So what does that look like? In comparison, we've talked about smart devices, your phone, your tablets, your computers. They all have microprocessors, they all have memory, they're wireless, they're connected to the internet, they perform these functions of voice and email, video and data, other applications that uh, we're all, we all have access to thousands of applications. In the future, our buildings, our cars are going to function with the energy internet in much the same way our phones function with the information internet. A building like this, uh, your house, your office, it will have smart lighting, smart heating and air conditioning systems, smart electronics. It will buy and sell and interact with the grid. And where that absence of local area infrastructure exists, buildings across the country will make up that needed infrastructure to strengthen the grid. There's a vision also that I think is very exciting, which is having electric vehicles that connect to these smart buildings and charge from solar power. So it, imagine a future where every day when you go to your place of business, you plug your car in and during the day, you've got these up on the roof of the building and they're charging your car and you never ever have to go to a gas station again and you never have to worry about the money being spent or transfer of wealth from the United States of America to foreign countries that aren't interested in our prosperity, they're only interested in what's bad for us. And that is an exciting, very exciting future when we think about what that may mean to smart cars. Uh, there's a, an experiment going on right now where they have a fleet of cars in a parking lot that during the day smartly interact with the building and when the building needs energy, it pulls energy out of the, car ba out of the batteries in the car to support the need. And effectively, the employees have agreed to let their cars be the backup power during the day so that the business doesn't have to pay for expensive peak energy. It's a very exciting future. Uh, if, you can, if you can envision these buildings being able to do this, your cars and your buildings and your homes. So, what does it all mean? Why do we care? Uh, yeah, that's interesting, but, you know, I go, I flip my light switch on. You know, why do I care? Well... Everybody pays a power bill, and in the future, the idea of buying power that is clean and renewable and available at all times should be exciting to us. But I can't think about what it means to America without thinking about what it means to this community. About three years ago, I was invited to be part of a panel, a task force, that studied this community to look at what our base infrastructure was to look at our sustainable path forward around energy and education. And it was just very exciting to learn about all the things that are going on in this community that are a part of and capable of participating in that future that I just described where every building is an iPhone and ET is IT. And we all are familiar with Huntsville's history with NASA and putting a man on the moon, but maybe what most aren't familiar with is that there's almost no technology today that doesn't have some DNA map back to NASA. And the space programs need to miniaturize technology to go into space. Uh, everything from healthcare to medicine to technology to things we see in our house every day that we use on a daily basis. So it's it's exciting to see that this community is participating in that and that they, the, the folks here that make up the audience here and businesses here are regularly meeting and participating and plotting and planning how to participate and make that difference. Lastly, what does it mean to the world? 
All around the globe, people are without energy and communications. And so, remember earlier, we had a brief discussion about how you felt when you went without power, you went without briefly with communications. All around the globe, there's multiple billions of people that do not have access to electricity, do not have access to communications. Uh, I think of a particular example. Recently, uh, an adjunct professor from MIT had contacted me about a program in Haiti where there was a healthcare organization serving 200,000 people in a 40-mile region, and they had access to power for two to three hours a day if they were lucky. And to look at the photographs and the instances of what was going on, and the solution was simple. They came up with a storage solution and a, a, a solar solution that will allow that healthcare organization to be open as long as the sun's shining and with the storage technology well into the evening time to serve that population. And that is a real tangible thing to see and understand. And when we think about what it means to the globe, to the people that have no access to power, have no access to uh, communications, there is no education, uh, there is no refrigeration for medication, uh, no chance to get to knowledge. Well, uh, imagine if you had satellites powered by solar, transmitting information and communications digitally just like we're doing here today, down to base stations anywhere on the planet, powered by solar, where they were able to have education, telemedicine, opportunity for everyone. That's not just a vision and imagination. Google launched that product 60 days ago, and it's called Loon. And it is a glimpse of what's gonna happen around the globe and so, I'd just like each and every one of you to think about what does this mean to you? Thank you very much.